This was years ago, when I was 23. My husband and I had recently rented a house in a new town. We had just left a church about two years before, because it had started becoming a cult. I had a lot of knowledge of the Bible at this point, and I was kind of searching, spiritually, for something. My husband was at work, and I was at home that day with my sons. They are two and three. It was pouring out. I got a knock on my door, which was the glass sliding door, so I could see the people outside. Immediately, I thought, more Jehovah Witnesses, with the Watchtower pamphlets. It was a white woman in a dress suit, and a tall Asian man in a suit. He was at least six foot. The man was holding a briefcase. We lived really closely to all the other houses in the neighborhood, and I had people that lived above us on the top floor, so I felt safe to go to the door and talk to them. I was about to tell them no thanks, but they said they were from the World Mission Society Church of God, and they wanted to tell me all about Mother God. This piqued my interest. If it wasn't raining, I would have talked to them through the screen door, but I felt bad and let them in my house. I know, so stupid. I definitely regretted it. We go into the living room, where my boys are playing. The lady gets the creepiest smile and is staring at my kids. She says, I love kids. I really want kids of my own. But I wasn't blessed with being able to. Then she starts telling me about their church and how Jesus or Mary was reborn in South Korea. She stops suddenly and tells me the guy can take my children in their room and play with them so we don't have to be distracted. Then she says something to him and I'm guessing Korean. This is when I knew I was an idiot and shouldn't have let them in. I said, absolutely not. My kids are fine right here. She tried to convince me that we needed quiet to pray to the mother. I was like, I don't care. I don't know you people. Then the guy opens his briefcase. It's got little shot glasses and a glass pitcher of some purple liquid in it. They told me, my children and I had to make communion right now to save our souls. I said, no way. I think it's time for you guys to leave. Her face changed, and she got angry. She started yelling, you and the children will burn in hell if you don't drink this now. Now I stood up and said, get out of my house now. Her face changed back to the creepy smile, and she said, okay, we're going to take the children with us to our church. There's tons of other kids there. I'll send you the address once we get there. I went into panic mode. I was already standing in front of my kids at this point. I started screaming, you're not touching my kids. Get out now. As I was walking towards them, she says, we need to save the children. At this point, the guy she's with seems kind of clueless like he's just waiting for her to tell him what to do. I'm screaming get out over and over again. I threatened to punch her. I know I can't take the guy on, so I'm thinking of how to get them out. A light bulb goes off in my head. I grab the phone out of my pocket and yell that I'm calling the cops. They turned around and ran out the back door. I watched them run down the street till I couldn't see them anymore. I told my husband when he got home from work. He was pissed I let them in, understandably. The next night I'm at work, and my husband's at home with the kids. Our house has a ton of windows, and besides our bedrooms, we didn't have curtains on them yet, so we just put the kids to bed. He's watching TV in the living room. He sees faces looking in the windows. He goes to the window and says, who are you? They ask for me, and if I'm there, and that I told them to come back tonight, and that they need to talk to me. My husband says, I know who you are. Get off my property. They go around to the next window and look in. Now he goes outside, trying to look for them, and they start running. My husband yelled after them that he was calling the cops. I don't remember if we ever made a police report or called them. It was a long time ago. I haven't seen them again, but I was scared for a long time after. I'm pretty sure that it was something about trafficking children, as well as a weird cult. Now I don't answer the door, unless it's someone I know. This is a story that my mother and aunts told me when I was in high school. 
I'm 21 now, and it has never left me. I think about it constantly and ponder over what happened. My grandfather passed away close to a year ago, in June of 2020. He was 96 when he died, and it caused some issues in my family. They don't really pertain to the story, but there are some things about him that I have to share in order to explain the story in the best way. My grandfather John was a man who was extremely calloused and old-fashioned. He was bitter, abusive, and a complete macho man. My mother was raised on never showing emotion or pain due to his abuse and lack of compassion for others. He was also an extreme racist. He had many secrets in my family that are now coming to light after his death. Everything that happened around him was brushed off and forgotten because he had more important things to do, like drinking and having affairs. Just an overall intense and very no-nonsense type of man. He also was not religious at all, and found things like faith and hope stupid. This story takes place sometime in the 70s, most likely early to mid 70s. My mom was born in 1965 and remembers this story clearly. My aunts as well remember this happening, but no one knows exactly what year. One summer day, John decided to take his family on a small outing with the intent to have a picnic in the woods. My mother, her three sisters, and my grandmother were all there, and very excited about this. Where we are from, my family is more accustomed to the woods, and has lived in the area for generations. Going into the woods for a family activity was nothing out of the ordinary, and seemed to be just another normal day. They made their way down a dirt backwards road, and stopped once they found a clearing large enough to accommodate them. As all the kids started jumping out of the car and messing around as kids do, after being stuck together, my grandmother began unloading their food and picnic supplies. John began surveying the area and deciding where to set up. As he was doing that, something in the woods past the clearing caught his eye. Before going to see what was out there, he yelled at the family and said he would be right back. The kids and my grandmother didn't think much of this, since they are all used to the woods, and these woods in particular were very familiar to them. And they continued unloading and setting up the stuff they brought. One of the girls pointed out something in the clearing that caused a sudden shift from a normal day to something far worse. It was a dirt mound that looked like something was buried under it. This mound was about the size of a small person, maybe even child-sized, it was too big to simply be an animal in these woods. There was nothing but squirrels and raccoons in the area. Scattered amongst the mound were larger river rocks. There was no pattern, but they were definitely placed on the mound intentionally. Also, the dirt seemed to be fresh, as though just buried. It was loose and slightly darker than the area around it. The mood immediately shifted from an average day in the woods to something much darker. My grandmother became concerned and told the girls to stay away from it. She was clearly upset and worried about it, but did her best to ignore it. The girls, all being children, didn't have the same amount of worry, and continued playing while just avoiding the mound. They tried to return to their picnic, and the girls were already chasing each other in circles again. It was supposed to be a joyous, sunny day, and my grandmother wanted to keep it that way. Things seemed to return to normal for a beat. The trees around them created a dense wall of foliage, blocking their view from anything else inside the forest. One of the girls again took notice of something strange. It was clear immediately what it was. Along one of the branches of the tree hung a noose. It was tied with a rope and hung high above their heads. A lump of dirt could be explained away by nature. But someone had to have placed the noose there. My grandmother stopped dead in her tracks when she first saw it. Something was wrong. Very, very wrong. They couldn't just pack up and leave. John was still out in the woods. Even children can recognize a noose as a symbol of death. The children started becoming very anxious. Whatever innocence was keeping them from worrying about the mound had completely vanished. My grandmother, the resilient woman she is, soothed her children and told them it was just left by deer hunters. 
but she knew in her heart they needed to leave. No deer hunter would hang a deer and then bury it. At least no sane deer hunter. It wasn't until they started hearing something in the woods that they began to really panic. My grandmother as well as all the children began hearing a rhythmic chanting from deep in the woods. It sounded as though there was a group of people all singing in deep voices to the beat of a drum. It went in a quick bum 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 pattern. Three steady beats, followed by a pause, and then it would repeat. It sounded far away, but immediately fear began to take hold of each of them. They each listened and gathered together. As the seconds passed, it began to increase in volume. It was not just getting louder, but closer. What started out as a distant echo soon began to engulf the entire clearing. My grandmother was terrified and wanted so desperately to leave, but John had yet to return. They waited, fear-ridden, as the sound began to fill their chests. It felt like they were at a concert as the deep bass began to vibrate in their chest. It was everywhere and constant, as though the sound was being made by the trees themselves, surrounding the family in every direction. Suddenly, the sound of yelling broke through the constant drone of chanting. John's voice was yelling out to them from the trees. Go, he yelled. Get in the car. He came running out of the woods, yelling that they needed to leave. They had never seen such terror on this man as they had in this moment. He was a man afraid of nothing, unbothered by the world around him. This was the most amount of emotion that any of them had ever seen from him. He saw something in those woods, something that shook his very being to the core. My grandmother began throwing everything back in the car as the kids got in as well. John and my grandmother picked up their things as quickly as possible and threw it all in the car. They had no care for the things they were packing up due to their fear. Food was all over the trunk and items were broken. After everything was tossed in, they both got in the car and drove away. This is where the main grunt of the story ends. But one fact from the story is what really has caused me to wonder all these years. My grandfather has refused to ever speak of what he saw. He never told any of the children or my grandmother. Every time this was brought up, he quickly rebuffed it and angrily told him not to ask again. He never went to the police or told someone outside of the family. My grandfather is the only person who knows what happened that day. When I first heard the story, I swore to myself I would ask him one day. And now I can't. And I regret that greatly. By the time I was in high school, he had moved out of the state with other family members. And I mostly lost contact with him, outside of the occasional happy birthday calls or letters. This story doesn't have an answer to go with it. When he died, the only thing I was sad about was never knowing what happened that day. We weren't close when I got older. And once I learned of all the abuse he caused, I separated myself from him. His death looms over me, and the story still haunts me to this day. My mother and aunts just look back on it as a spooky memory from their childhood. Nothing more than a story to spook the little ones at Thanksgiving with. I am one of the only people in the family who is still curious about what happened. I've always been interested in mysteries, the occult, horror, and conspiracy theories. This story piqued my interest more than any others in my family. Which, by the way, this isn't the only story from my family, but it definitely is the most strange. I wish I had answers. For some context, I left school almost five years ago which is about a 15 to 20 minute bus ride from where I currently live, so still local. Anyway, there are some woods on one side of the school, which also go a little bit behind the school as well. Behind those woods, there's a lot of large fields. There is also a house in the middle of those fields, where an old man supposedly lives. Although the area is generally considered safe, there are quite a few strange stories and actual events that took place around the area. The stories tell of paranormal stuff going on, alleged criminal activity, and just weird stuff in general. However, 
Many of these stories are not published in the news or anything, so no one really knows how much of them are true, or how many are just made up things that are just going around from mouth to mouth. One story that did make the news was that a person who was missing for about two months at the time was found tied to a tree in front of the school, on the school premises. The body was tied so tight that they had to cut the whole tree down just to get rid of the body, so someone else must have been involved as well. Although nothing has been made public afterwards, there are many other strange things that happened in my area, many of which have been confirmed by one of my mates who live across the road from the school. I'm going to tell my strangest and scariest story of what I've been through while in this area, and probably being the strangest thing I have ever personally encountered. So here's the story. A few years ago, my friends and I were playing football at the school's football pitch, like we usually were. We were there for hours, which was nothing out of the ordinary. There were about six of us, and there was another separate group of about seven to eight people, which we didn't talk to or anything, as we didn't know them, and they didn't know us. My friends and I were at the end nearest to the school, and the forest was the complete opposite side, about 80 to 85 yards away, or thereabouts. At one point, one of my mates noticed two people wearing masks, standing still at the other end, just staring at us. The masks looked similar to the Guy Fox mask, but they were somewhat different. They were on the other side of the fence, so we just ignored them, thinking it was someone from the other group playing some kind of joke before joining them. However, they were still just standing there, about 15 minutes later. We asked the people from the other group if they knew them, or if they knew what was going on, and they say they noticed them as well, but they thought they were from our group, which they definitely weren't. They stood there for five minutes or so before leaving, so everyone just sort of ignored what just happened and kept playing with their groups. We heard a scream about half an hour later, which sounded like a female scream. The friend who lived across the road called his mom to make sure she was okay and to ask if she had seen anything. She said she was alright, that she heard the scream as well and was about to call us to see if we were okay. So we just started playing again. Shortly after we started playing again, we heard and saw a police car and an ambulance speeding on the road outside the school. About ten minutes after the scream and the phone call, there were about five people standing where the two previous people stood, and they were just staring at us. A few of them had masks, the others didn't. Over the next few minutes, there were more and more people joining them, coming from different areas of the woods. Again, some of them had masks, some didn't. I think that in total, there were somewhere around 30 people just standing there staring at us. We obviously got scared, and it was clear that the other group playing football was scared too. We all eventually stopped playing, and we were just looking at them, and they were still staring at us. The other group joined us, so that we could all be as far away from the group as possible. We had no idea what to do. We didn't know whether we should talk to them or not. If we made the right choice by acknowledging them, we didn't know if there were more people coming, or if they would come onto the pitch. This was during the six-week summer holiday, so the school was closed and everything was locked up. However, someone managed to unlock one door that was facing the forest. The door that was used if someone kicked a ball over the fence during PE. This meant that we were trapped. We couldn't get out without going through them, and we had no idea where to go if they decided to walk towards us. It felt like we all just stood there, looking at them, and they were looking at us for an eternity but it was probably only a couple of minutes. We then all huddled up and decided what we should do, and we came to the conclusion that we should call the police. Even if we would have been told off for trespassing or whatever, our safety was more important. However, we were all too scared to call 999, as it turned out none of us had ever done it before. One of my friends volunteered to do it, so he got his phone out and had 999 dialed up. He just needed to actually call the number. However, as he was about to do so, we heard the ambulance 
and the police cars driving the other way, and the people started walking away. Pretty much straight after, the cars had passed the school. We decided to wait a little more, to make sure they wouldn't be waiting for us somewhere in the forest, which we had to walk through for a couple of minutes to get to the main road. Someone from the other group actually called his older brother and his mates to come check. We waited for maybe an hour more, after which we decided to get out of there to find the guy's brother and quite a few of his friends waiting for us. They laughed at first, but then we told them what had happened and they stopped laughing at us. Now it could have easily been someone just messing with us, but I highly doubt it with that many people taking part. My mates and I still don't know why they were there, just staring at us, or what their intentions were, which probably adds to the eeriness. But yeah, this is the strangest and scariest thing I've been through in this area, where something weird was definitely going on. A few years ago, going home from college, I'm a female, and I was 19 at the time. I was sitting in the bus for the daily long hour ride. This middle-aged man was sitting in a row of seats away from me, in a way that had him almost facing me. I had noticed he was staring at me for quite a while now. It was making me gradually more uncomfortable. So at one point, I looked up at him and gave him an awkward smile to let him know that I had seen him. He could stop. I thought if he realized I was aware this whole time, he would be embarrassed to be caught. Obviously, I had to take it as an invitation and smiled back. Then asked me if I believed in God. I shook my head and said, no, sorry, with a polite laugh, and took my phone out to go on social media to make it clear that I didn't want to talk. He stayed quiet and continued staring at me for a few seconds. Then he got up and decided to come sit right next to me. He was very obviously waiting for me to look at him. You know, the very awkward close-up stare. While I was very clearly not interested, I can see you are very kind and sweet, is the first thing he said. Now because I was raised to always be nice, and because I was too young to know how to stand my ground, I didn't stop him. So he carried on. The entire interaction felt like he was trying to convince me to join his community. He would tell me about how he knows kind people like me aren't appreciated enough in this world. But in his church, they are understood and loved. He would say that God chose him to look for other souls to be rescued, and that he would see signs of God's plan in the way I appeared to him. He told me I might not know it yet, but I was searching for God in my life. And it showed in the way that I let him talk to me. It lasted maybe 10 to 15 minutes. And the whole time he was calm and confident, like he was teaching me something, very close to my face, showing a reassuring smile and looking for my eyes. And his hand was placed on my seat, in a way that his arm was touching my back. I was unsettled and very uncomfortable. I would look at him and quickly nod sometimes, in hopes that he would get the message that I had enough. I got it, and he could leave me alone. He ended up asking me if I had Facebook and gave me a small paper card with the phone number. The name of his community. It was something like God's true words or message. And a Facebook link to a private group. He encouraged me to give him a call and then left. I was at Huntington Beach, doing a celebration banquet for the school's band. And as the night was coming to a close, some band kids noticed that some people were circulating a bonfire. My buddy and I were going to try and join them, because we thought they were joking. But then someone about 10 to 20 feet began starting to hit a bell, and everyone that was circulating the bonfire started walking towards the bell. Just wait, this gets creepier. We suddenly notice that there are candles in the sand, about 10 to 15. The people get in a circle, and some of them start to remove their clothing. At this point, I really had to take a piss. 
So I'm walking to the bathroom at the beach, and in the distance, I can hear all the people, potentially doing a ritual, start screaming really loud. This was really creeping me out. I go back to where the band group was, and everyone was packing everything up. It was about 9.30 or 10, almost beach closing time. And as I return, some people in the candle circle are walking on all fours, while some people are standing doing a T-pose while they are saying some things that are simply indecipherable to me. And then they proceed to all strip down to their underwear and run into the ocean. Hey guys, hopefully you've enjoyed this cold video. So if you don't mind, leave a like and comment. And if this is your first time here, feel free to subscribe. I also turn on notifications, so that way, you're kept up to date with my latest releases. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Reddit. All the links are in the description. And thanks again for checking the video out. I'll see you in the next one, guys.